Hello, everybody. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Um, it's an honour because it's the second year that, I, that I, I've done this, and I just love the commitment you've got in your part of the world. Um, would that it was like that absolutely everywhere. I'm really, really sorry that I can't make the event live on Saturday. Just, just couldn't do it. But I'm completely committed that if you can be bothered putting up with me, I'd love to come and see what you're doing and and do anything I can to help you because I do think. You know, you, the way is always led from the grassroots. And I think that what this talk is going to be about is how ultimately communities and those that um, represent them at a very local level can make a big difference to how we live our lives in the future and can really contribute to, in a positive way to uh, a sense of kind of prosperity. So that's what this is all about. Um, and, and so maybe if we just start showing the slides for those of you who've seen it before, um, it's not hopefully death by PowerPoint. Um, uh, I hope that these slides uh, um, resonate with you. I'm sure lots of you are doing this already, but I hope that what we can see today, for those of you who may have seen what we were uh, showing last year, that if you stick to what I like to say, you're knitting, keep on, even though you feel that it may be inconsequential what you're actually doing. Actually, it plays out completely differently because we can only make the big changes if each and every one of us make the small changes. And in order to do that, we mustn't see them as small changes. We must see them as pieces of a jigsaw that forms a brilliant picture about what that kind of prosperity in the future can actually be. And if we hold that dear and we stick to what we're doing, then we will see the changes come and we will show our national leaders just what we can actually do together at a grassroots level to grow this new normal. So I'm just going to talk you through this. And if there's been some stuff that you've already seen before, then forgive me. But I think it starts to tell a story that happened 14 years ago. Next slide, please. In the place that I call home, which is Todmorden in the South Pennines, where after a, a conference that I went to uh, with Tim Lang, who obviously is a leading thinker on food and the planet and sustainability. And he kind of challenged us in the audience um, to do things differently, to think about things. At time was slipping through our fingers and we really needed to roll up our sleeves and crack on. So that really resonated with me because, you know, as I've said to many people before, I, I, you know, I'm old. <laughs> And I have been excited in the past 20 odd years ago, pushing 30, about the Rio Earth Summit. And I was excited about the potential that we could actually do something that would pass over to our children a future that was good and respective of the environment and connected to the environment. But that sadly, I had felt that I hadn't seen a lot of progress on that. You know, as, as Robert said, council leader, chair of a health trust, national stuff, whatever it might be, all that kind of like confirmed in my mind that there was no point in waiting for anybody else to start doing stuff because that was an excuse. And if we put ourselves in that box of, well, they didn't do it, so why should I do it? We, we become a victim and actually we're not victims, we're all solution finders. And I hope this, this little story I'm about to tell shows you that. So 14 years ago in this town that I call home, in the South Pennines, which lies more or less equidistant between Manchester and Leeds, um, we turned some of those grey spaces in a town that had kind of lost its identity, had a great culture of um, community work in the past, was a place where, you know, the textile re revolution was making a difference in people's lives in those days, but since then have been overtaken by the likes of the big cities around them and by you know, the, the changes in how people worked and therefore needed to start to believe in itself again. And so getting on that train 14 years ago, I pondered how on earth that was going to happen. And it seemed to me that if we can truly believe in each individual's potential to shape their lives in a different way and through that, through serendipity, quite frankly, find those others that are also connected to that vision of a future, that positive future that isn't about negativity, but is about what we can actually contribute. If we do that, then the best language we could use, it seemed to me, was food. Because so many people just thought the problems were too large. 
you know, how many times, oh, well, what are China doing? Or what are India doing? Well, honestly, let the Chinese and Indians worry about that. Let us worry about what we're doing. And let us remember that not everybody subscribes to The Guardian, The Telegraph, or whatever. Not everybody's read the IPCC reports. And yet everybody cares about their future and their family and their community. And our potential solution finders in the place they call home, if they were only given the opportunity to realize their potential and invest in their own gifts. So with food as the, as the universal language that unites in the, uh, across income, age, culture, and ability, I got back home and we started to turn the place we call home from what it is on the left of the screen to how it appears on the right of the screen. That is to say, we started to grow food in very public places, in places where people would stop and look and think, well, that was a dog toilet yesterday. How come they're growing herbs in it now? Propaganda gardens, as we call them, because they were about talking about a different future, talking to strangers, thinking about food, perhaps never having seen how Brussels sprouts grow in the past perhaps never having smelt rosemary or sage or whatever else it might be. These propaganda gardens planted up in very public places, in the center of the places that we call home, kicked off a conversation that went from strength to strength. Next, please. Just to remind ourselves what this is about. Yes, it's about food. Yes, particularly at the moment, we are deeply concerned about justice and sovereignty. We're concerned about hunger. We're concerned about the injustices in the way that folks who can't afford to live well have to put up with food that is not good for them and their children. And don't even know that they should be questioning that it's not good for them and their children. But ultimately, this is about more than food, isn't it? This is about everything that we do in our lives that can contribute collectively towards that sustainable future that North Norfolk is so committed to us and why Greenville is such an important event. I referred to the Rio Summit. There'll be people in the audience who remember that and Kyoto and Copenhagen and dare I say even nearer Paris and then Glasgow was up there at COP. Words are fine, deeds are better. So what we've got now is because we've seen more words than we've seen deeds, because we've got even more reports and even more studies and even more commitment. And yet, where is the sense of urgency for change, for delivery in a different way, for investment in a different way? Well, it's still a bit thin on the ground, but I have every hope that we can start to work together in North Norfolk and really see that difference come into fruition because you're well on the way. And as I said before, I wish everybody was in that position. So we've seen the huge weather swings, we've seen the health problems, you know, we're not going to have the last of the pandemics. We've seen the water wars on the horizon, we, we're not even going to be able to imagine what the, um, the, the passing of people from countries that are water um, void into places that are better to live in, that migration. We need to start to think about how we can make places more livable for people, even the people that we'll never ever meet. But it starts in the place you call home. If you stop flying stuff all over the planet, you stand a chance of letting those people in the places you're flying it from be able to eat their local food. If you start to think sensibly about how you actually travel or, where, or, 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 or the sorts of places that you want to live or whatever, you start to reduce the impact on the environment and that has the knock on effect in years to come for people we may never meet, but who care deeply about their families. So with that lack of leadership 14 years ago, and I have lived through Local Agenda 21, and I have done all that, and it was great, but where did it go? It was time to roll up our sleeves, stop moaning, and crack on to do something ourselves. Next, please. And so on that, you know, on that train, I literally made up the model for Incredible Edible, because you've got to be able to kind of like draw it in a really simple way so people know what you're banging on about and that you don't just want to grow cabbages all over the place. So because I invented it and it needed to be simple and it was all about food, I used the idea of community activity around food by spinning plates. Three different plates coming together by people's actions on the ground in those places, villages, towns, boroughs, wherever it might be, it doesn't matter. The scale of the place doesn't matter. It's the neighborhood you live in that you're having an impact on. 
we galvanized communities and we started planting up in very public places and we planted all manner of things you know we we, we turned up that dog toilet that i mentioned uh, cleaned it all up ourselves never asked permission of anybody to do it because quite frankly they'd have had to write a report it would have had to have gone to committee it was it was a grass verge on the side of the road in the middle of town and it was horrible so we cleared it up we put on our gloves we went out there. We didn't spend a load of money. We just planted up herbs. We planted up bushes that we could find. That you know, we took stuff from our front garden if we got, thought we got too many um, soft fruit bushes or whatever it might. And we planted it in there. And suddenly, it became a great little spot. And within nine months, the local authority, bless them, who've always been a joy to work with, put a bench there so people could sit in it and enjoy it. Everybody doing their bit to say yes, as opposed to setting themselves up to say no. And the only reason they say no is the system doesn't allow them to say yes. So we're kind of like trying to bring confidence to them from the grassroots. So we created the propaganda gardens in front of the police station, in front of the um, local college, in front of the doctor's surgery, at the train station, just making it up as we went along because we weren't asking for money at that time. We were just using our own resources. We were going out there every week or every fortnight or as often as we could. In the numbers, it started to grow over time, but started very small. Of course, it doesn't matter how many of you there are, as long as you're out there doing the stuff, explaining to people with a big smile on your face about what's growing there and what you can do with it and why you can use sage and for sore throats as well as for, you know, making stuffing or whatever it might be. Conversations at a local level in your own neighbourhoods. And then the second plate was fairly obvious because so many people didn't know how to grow, but fundamentally, they also didn't know how to cook. Nobody bothered teaching them how to do things, how to make food that was nutritious, but fairly cheap. And nobody's going to grow anything if they don't know what to do with it. So again, in conversation with people in our local community, we started to say to them, well, do you know how to graft a tree? Because half of us don't know how to do that. Do you want to come on Sunday afternoon and show us how to do that? And that pass it on mentality, that, you know, buying a pop-up tent that didn't cost a right load of money, and I think it was a local church that lent it to us in the first place, that we just put up on the middle of an estate. Again, we didn't have permission to do that. We just set it up in the middle of the estate. We got the local cook from the school to come and do some cooking lessons. He showed people how to make whatever was in season, a soup of or whatever. And then we handed out some seeds for that particular vegetable so that people could plant them in their own gardens. Very, very simple steps, but really important because nobody bothered doing that traditionally. You know, the people for the people. We'd had people coming in we have been paid to do that and that was fantastic and wonderful. But ultimately there is something about that self-help, that people helping each other because they recognize each other and they recognize the need to change. And then that third plate came along, which was, we didn't know we could do this, but you know, I'm an economist, not an environmentalist. And it's really simple. You get the economy, you spend your money on and that's it. You know, and you can't do a right lot about stuff that's overseas or, you know, that, that's at a national level, but you can support your local market. You can use a pound in your pocket if you're fortunate enough to actually buy your cheese from the local market or do whatever it is that you can afford that says to those stall holders or those local, you know, street food vendors or whatever, I really like it. And having come from a retail side, there's nothing like folks doing that. It brings a smile to your face and you really want to get up in the morning and do even better. So the proposition was simple. If people walk past edible landscapes day in, day out in the place they call home, so they become more accustomed to what grows, to seasonality, they clock biodiversity, they start to take an interest with the kids in what are the bees doing and what are pollinators about and whatever. If you've actually got those conversations going day in, day out, and I'm talking, you know, this isn't a one, two, three year plan. This is for how we live our lives in greener, healthier communities. And if you're also sharing with people how to do stuff um, and making it, making it perfectly obvious that it's, it's not scary, you don't need a degree to be able to do this, you just need somebody to show you what the ingredients of any one plate actually are, then you are more likely to want to spend that pound in your pocket in support of a local business rather than nip to the supermarket, which so many of us do. And I am not anti-supermarket at all, but I am for developing an alternative prep proposition and investing whatever we've got in making that a really viable, low carbon economic opportunity. Next, please. Well, that happened in Tomberdon, you know, and we just did it and we just made it up and we kicked off by, you know, having a, a meeting in a cafe 
and we put you know the notices up and what we said was not oh sustainability and peak oil and heaven knows what no 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 we, we said do you want a better future for your kids do you want them to be able to eat well do you want jobs and food where they eat? what what do you think do you want to come and have a chat with us in the cafe and see what and 60 people turned up i mean it was a huge surprise and the guy who was the cook from the school who was passionate about growing in the school grounds and wanted people to understand how to cook that stuff he talked and the guy who'd actually run an aquaponics unit somewhere wanted to talk about how we can actually grow food in a different way. And I was just saying, look, it's in our own hands. We have a lot of spare land around here. It's called Public Realm. Why don't we just grow in it and share the food from it? And why don't we make it look wonderful and greener and get more connected to the people themselves rather than have people throw cigarette packets on it because it's nothing to do with them. So although that happened in Tobedon, once we told the story, it happened all over the place and the fires went all over the country. They happened in Wakefield, they happened in Bristol, they happened in Liverpool and in Manchester and in Lambeth at different scales. You know, we were in some small villages. We were also in Lambeth, 400,000 people plus, where they worked out for themselves because this isn't a central hierarchy telling you how to do things. This is, you've got three plates to spin and we need to live life differently in the future. So how are we going to grow a new normal in a place you call home? That's the question. And so Lambert did it completely differently. They collected together a network of people who were already doing community gardening or whatever it might be. And they talked to each other and they built up that sense of the movement that they were in Lambert. And they got strength from being part of that movement in Lambert. And they could share resources in Lambert. And they could visit each other's sites in Lambert. So it worked at a different scale. And soon we had 120 groups and now we're in excess of 150 groups. And it's not just in the UK because people all over the world want to begin to understand how they can live their lives within the planetary boundaries without having to know exactly what the details of the IPCC's um, reports are all about. They know that we need to change and it's all too big for us as individuals, mums, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmas, granddads. What are we going to do? Well, you know, we just plant food and share it. That's the start of it. We make food, we cook food, we share food, we support, that's all we do. And with a sense of trust, these communities all over the world have started to really grow and feel that they have an agency in this thing called climate crisis. And that they may not be the solution to everything, but they've got that little piece of the jigsaw that's making a difference in the place they call home. Next, please. So, it looked like we might be growing a movement. And that was kind of interesting because quite frankly, when I was on that train coming from London to Manchester, I had no sense of that. I just had some sense that I couldn't stand feeling <sighs> disempowered. When I knew perfectly well, there's loads of stuff I could do just off my own bat. I've got half seed packets in the bottom drawer. Why am I not growing food and, and sharing? You know, and there's people like that all over the world. So. With that sense of serendipity and trust in each other, that growing movement and those stories we were telling each other was something that was both a surprise and an absolute joy. Next, please. Because what folks were doing, and this is quite interesting, was not seeing themselves as cabbage growers or sage growers. They were starting to redefine the spaces of their lives. They were starting to take unloved green spaces and make them verdant and productive. They were starting to look at horrible little backwaters that could actually grow some fantastic food for those people on that estate that lived near them. They were starting to see the grey infrastructure and imagining what it would be like if it had got plants all over it. They were starting to look differently at their train station platforms and think, well, why don't we just grow herbs all along it and help ask people to, 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 to come and help themselves to it? And for those of us that can't actually grow very well, why don't we make some fantastic signs? And why don't we hand out recipes on a Saturday morning about what we do with them? Whatever, whatever comes into your mind. And again, this is not about scale as such, as about spread, because we are operating at a human level. And at a human level, we're not making widgets that need to be scaled up to be cheaper. At a human level, we are spreading the idea of what an edible town, village, borough, city might look like 
and how we can all benefit from it. And we're not worrying about the next village because we're doing our own stuff in ours. And here are just some slides to show you if you've not already seen them, what that might look like. That one bang in the center is on an estate. This is incredible edible Salford on an estate outside Manchester where collectively the community created a community interest company and started to grow. That has now moved on from that estate to create a community, a forest garden that combines the very best of that, but also has an educational side to it. Also has a side where people can, can just chill out on a hot day, but is one that's very much owned by that community and is bang in the middle of a built up area. And from that community forest, you can see the motorway. Isn't it interesting? It's not all in the leafy suburbs. It's right in the heart of the communities that we're starting to change our perspective and our relationship to the land around us. That's me in the bottom left-hand corner years ago when we decided the thing to do was to um, take up Northern Rail, um, who at the time had said, yeah, we don't mind you having those uh, plants on the platform. That's great. It actually makes us look jollier. They didn't want to do much about them, although they always watered them, which was fantastic. And we never asked them to do that. And watering is something that we might want to talk about in the future. But in a corner of the car park, there was this horrible area. And so we said, can we do something with that? Um, and they said, OK, yeah, all right. Well, let's see what we can do. So together we had a bit of a chat and they contributed towards the membrane because it was a pretty grotty area. So the, the wonderful people from the payback came and dug it all out. And we, with them, put in the membrane and with wood that we'd been given, built the raised beds and started to grow. And that was edible flowers. You can see them in the nasturtiums or it might be kale or it might be potatoes. Or what. And, you know, nobody trashed it. Nobody trashes propaganda gardens. And on the odd occasion something goes wrong, because it always will, you've not just destroyed the Taj Mahal. You've just had a tree broken off or something. You plant another one. And if somebody needs to go and dig up all your onions or all your potatoes, it's because they need all your onions and your potatoes. So you just grow more next year. It's not rocket science. And once we started to do that and tell those stories, other people came along as well. So on the bottom, uh, in the middle and to the right, you've got two great examples of where the fire service in Manchester in the bottom there said, we really like this because we in the fire service, we have downtime. And we also, in our community fire stations, are in the middle of some pretty challenging communities. So why don't we just put notices in people? They said, do you want to come and, you know, do you want to come and help us grow food at the front? And that's what happened. So they built the raised beds and they built them with their communities. And people who perhaps had a tendency to do things that were a bit on the dodgy side started to do things that were less on the dodgy side. And of course, it doesn't work for everybody. And it's not a universal panacea, but it started to bridge links and conversations with people that weren't there before. And all they were doing was growing food on the land that previously had been grass which was only good for feeding cows. The one on the right was the police station. And we did, we, I mean, we just had to do it because it's in the middle of Tomberden. That one on the bottom, by the way, the, the fire station was, was nothing to do with Tomberden. It was the, um, it, it, in one of the community fire stations in Manchester. But the one on the right, the, just, the, 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 just the police station, they just had this open space in front of the police station. It was just calling up somebody to do something. So we knocked on the door. We didn't wear ballot gloves in the middle of the night because it was the police. Not that we ever wear barrack balaclavas in the middle of the night, you understand, but sometimes we ask and sometimes we don't. But with the police, we asked and they said, OK, as long as we don't have to maintain it and you're not going to ask us for money, crack on. So we did. We, we won some uh, wood from B&Q. We got some soil donated from a local farmer. And the rest of it was stuff we had in our bottom drawer, seeds and the like. And we started to plant up the stuff that you can see there. And we would make some signs because not everybody reckoned we planted sweet corn, by the way, because we just had it on us and it grows taller than the police. And we thought it was amazing. And they've done that every year since. But people didn't know when to pick things. That's, this was increasingly obvious. So we, we, we did simple things. Those that didn't want to grow would make would paint up wooden boards in red, amber and green with some sliding things across them. Nothing fancy at all that showed when it was red, it wasn't ready. When it was amber, it was nearly. When it was green, it was help yourself. These are simple messages that reconnect people with seasonality and with food. Next, please. So besides changing the spaces, besides spreading, we were changing the spaces. 
And this is really important because increasingly as we go through this, we start to see that we are part of an even bigger movement. If we start to think about the Garden City movement, if we start to think of the big movements that run across the states, if we start to think about the diggers all those years ago in Wigan, in the north of England, we are part of an ordinary community, not trying to take over anything, but trying to change the nature which has an impact on our relationship and on our mental health and well-being and our physical well-being and our sense of loneliness as opposed to and our sense of being part of a community as a part of lonely as opposed to loneliness. And all we're doing is growing veg or fruit or herbs. So what 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 happened? Well, um, bottom, um, wonderful people on the Isle of Bute in Scotland decided they really liked this. There was an identity there that they wanted to establish for Butte, so they started Incredible Edible on the shorefront. On the right-hand side, wonderful group of ladies in Rochdale in the north of England, where there was some spare land next to the medical centre, started to grow on the medical centre, linked up with a housing association that was associated with that land, and collectively started to grow food that many people hadn't grown themselves, but were showing other people how to grow and how to pick the seeds of radish and how you could use those in a curry or whatever the converse, however the conversation went. And increasingly there was evidence that from a social care and a health perspective, there was something we could really do to change those spaces in those health sites. So you know, we said to the health people and we said to the social care people, why don't we come together? You've got car parks, you've got grey infrastructure. Why don't we work with you and see if you've got people who actually come to your surgery or you know, live in that particular care home who want to run their own incredible edible and want to do things differently. And folks did. And the one at the top that shows that gathering of people is a wonderful chair of the clinical commissioning group, who's the guy in glasses, who was a bit bored like I was about waiting for somebody to decide that the disaster was so far you know, imminent, we had to do something now. Yeah, I, I'd already spoken to people in the local authority and beyond and said, you know, could, could we work together on this? And they all got very excited, um, as did the chair of the hospital trust and the like. And then six months later, we had another meeting. So luckily, the chair of the clinical commissioning group said, we can't wait any longer, shall we? Come to my surgery and we'll crack on there. So we started to take over that surgery. The people of the community, not this kind of like, Red Adair, drop in, get it sorted out and leave again. We worked with those people in that community, very diverse community, and we started to change places that were car parks into growing spaces. Within four months of doing that, 50 people were turning up on a regular monthly meeting to crack on, and then COVID came. And it has been a challenge since COVID, but we still have those raised beds. We still have that converted mess of land to the side of the uh, of the car park of the doctor's surgery which is now set growing fruit uh, fruit and veg all over the place and we have that connection between good health and local food and that's what this is all about and we are trying to encourage those people to grow their own food in their own backyards because they don't always have to come out to a doctor's surgery once a month although it's a great place to meet they can actually feed themselves and their neighbors from their own front and back gardens and of course what also happened it's, it's pointless if people that are my age are the only ones that are doing it. But young people who are so frustrated about the lack of action in some of these areas start to get involved. And the bottom left-hand one is young people who, uh, working with some of their mums and dads in Port Maddock in Wales, got this fantastic composter, started to understand the importance of soil, started to understand about oribatid mites when they'd never heard of them before, started to see that it wasn't about waste, but it was about bringing back onto this planet that much needed component of good, active, living soil. So, and all we're doing, yet again, is growing food in places that are unloved. Next, please. And the last thing, of course, is just to remind ourselves that once we start doing that, we start to think differently, don't we? We start to feel better. We start to know more people. We start to think it's, you know, it's what we want to do on a Sunday morning to go out for two hours and then celebrate by eating food together. And it's always a good idea after an incredible edible dig to make sure that people are fed and that they can relax and talk to each other and ask each other questions. But the impact on local economies, I think, is significant. 
because we've just got into the habit of buying things the way we do. As individuals, as anchor institutions, as national players, but we don't have to always do that. We can have a much more mixed economy. So by encouraging more people to think about where their food came from, and we ran a campaign in the early days called Every Egg Matters. And the reason we ran that is that we were thinking, well, you know, people just don't think about where their food comes from. So let's do something without making them feel bad about it. And, you know, having placards outside their house. Let's do something that makes them think, oh yeah, that's lovely. So we asked folks uh, that we knew, um, if they sold eggs locally, and maybe eight or 10 that we knew did at the bottom of their garden or their track or wherever it might be. So we created a stylized drawing of the roots into Tottenham, and we put little blobs on it where people were selling local eggs. And then we went out every week into the local market and we handed out uh, leaflets that said, these people are you know, buying local eggs, are you? And more and more people were putting their blobs on the map. And we ended up with 30 odd. And all that did was to ask, get people to think, oh yeah, I had never thought about where my eggs come from. So they'd go into the local shop and they said, are these Tom and eggs? Or they'd go into the local market and ask where it came from. And as a result of that, and it might be that, or it might be bread, or it might be jam, or whatever else it might be, the people who were the producers and the people who were farming or the smallholders who were growing were getting more confident because more people were asking about the provenance of things than had ever done so before and more people were buying local food. And that encouraged more people to actually start to invest in that local economy. Whether it's a veg box scheme, whether it's a small holding scheme, whether it's like the bottom two, which are two communities who have taken over their local markets. The one on the right at the bottom is a wonderful community in Radcliffe, who, and Radcliffe is on the outskirts of Bury, which is on the outskirts of Manchester. A lot of these examples are Northern, but of course we are all over the place. But the bottom line was it was going into disrepair. That market hall was going down the pan. So they came together and they said, no, we, with the local authority and the local authority worked with them to run the place. And there was a guy downstairs who was um, making micro salads. He was, uh, there was a guy who'd just come out of prison who was finding himself at a loose end. And he started growing food in one of the allotments outside this market hall. And he was selling that back or giving it back to some of the traders in the market hall. So we were starting to create a local economy. So the pizza place and the curry place and the pie place were using local veg and the like, all of which was starting to build up that low carbon, localized economy without anybody having to come in and do anything. And of course it goes on to community supported agriculture, Land Workers Alliance or whatever you want to say. There are, one can operate at any scale here. It's the bit that you know you can start on. That's where you start. You don't worry about where it's going. Just start on a path and you will find you will go towards a great community of people who want to see the world a much kinder place to live in. Next, please. So I've got 144 groups. This is out of date. It, it's, they pop up all over the place. You know, I haven't got any statisticians sat in a corner. All that I do is get emails every now and again, as do the board, as do other groups from folks that have set up groups. So we're in excess of 160. We've got 17 who've popped up around Leeds. We're working with people in Australia. There's amazing stuff going on in France. And they come and they go. But the bottom line is the spirit of Incredible Edible, of people taking hold of their own futures through local food and finding ways through kindness of connecting with their community is something that just, it, it, you know, it's, it brings joy to my heart every time I think about it because there is no master plan other than we're all ready to roll up our sleeves and live that kind of future. Next, please. But that was only ever half the plan. Because the thing is, we've all been around blocks and we all know people say, oh yeah, but you can't make any difference. That's just that little thing. I mean, you know, I mean what we need is big policies. Mm. Not denying that that's the case. And we also get people, yeah, but can you prove it was any good? Can you show it improved people's well-being? Can you show it stopped the loneliness and all that other stuff? And we just kept batting on because the very fact that we maintained 130, 140, 160, an international relationship with communities all over the globe, the very fact that that was happening and changing the spaces and the places of people's lives is quite honestly proof positive that we ourselves are capable of making some of the big decisions in our lives and we are capable of building that kind of future. That, it seems to me, was the proof of concept. 
And of course, people have come behind that. And the wonderful thing is there's marvellous reports gone out by EAT and Lancet. There's fantastic stuff being done with the people we're working with at uh, Lancaster and Preston University. Um, who are showing that we can produce 40% of our food close to our urban areas. We don't have to be buying stuff all over the place. There's a lot more stuff we can actually do if we think seasonally, if we upskill our communities, and if we take seriously what we can actually grow at a local level. Not saying we could do everything, but we can certainly make inroads to what's happening at the moment. Next, please. Because with the best will in the world, we are moving along a trajectory away from doing two people, away from doing four people, almost away from with people, towards the possibility of by people. What we know is local government and anchor institutions have been decimated over the past decade. And wonderful local officers, and the servants of the people in the democratic structure must be at their wits end about how they can bring well-being to their communities and how can they can improve their communities and whatever it might be. And the truth of the matter is, if we start to put some of that on its head and we start to say, okay, how can we be the servant leader that helps people do, do stuff for themselves? Then maybe we can start to see that there is a new relationship between ourselves and our anchor institutions that actually delivers a better future with the challenges around the climate. Next, please. This is what we're after. We have shown on the left, the proof of concept is there. Yeah, if it's not incredible edible, then look at social farms and gardens. If it's not that, look, there's 101 different organizations that are proof of concept that people themselves are perfectly capable in the place they call home of growing and connecting and feeding and looking after and building that sense of a local identity and a local economy. What we need is two hands clapping. What we need is to create a framework that makes it easier for everybody to do that. What we need is to work with those anchor institutions, whether it's local government, whether it's the NHS, whether it's housing associations or whatever, that see the need for change and see the benefits of engaging their communities more proactively. What we need is to work with them so we can change the framework of the way in which people operate in order that we take the obstacles away from those people who want to crack on with building that kind of prosperity in the places they call home. Thinking about food. I am not talking about suddenly local people are creating armies that fight each other. I am talking about people's ability to feed and nurture themselves and through that process live better, healthier lives. Next, please. So just imagine what it would take if every neighborhood was incredible edible. If every citizen was a respected partner in fighting climate change. If we didn't have to rely on goodwill to grow our food locally, but had something else. Imagine if we actually could create the circumstance by which more people could feel their right to feed their communities and to adapt for change. Because there are some fantastic examples, the length and breadth of the country, of great local authorities and wonderful housing associations who are doing part of this. But there are also examples where no is the answer when people want to grow food locally, or where land is taken back from people who were growing on it in order that something else could be done by it, with it before a conversation has gone on with those local people about what an alternative might be. So this isn't about us demanding that everybody gives everything up and all the decisions are at a grassroots level. But this is about saying, how might we start to make the changes that allowed people at a local level to be more a part of the decisions that impact on their everyday health and well-being. Next, please. What if we actually worked with people at a local level as well as a national level to repurpose public realm for people to grow their food and for people to improve environmentally and for people to reconnect to a more sustainable future rather than have a public realm that we can't look after in the way that we used to do? a public realm that can be discarded, a public realm that can't be loved 
by local people because they don't see their connection with it. What have we actually thought about a right to land? What about if we started to think about designing our towns and cities with food at their hearts? What if we reinvented, if you want to put it that way, the garden city movement? I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but you know, it's not an original idea. But it he makes a heck of a difference to a child growing up in a place that's growing food right from the center of its town a place that's got green spaces, it's got birds and butterflies and bees right in the heart of its town, right next to where people live. Imagine that child 10 years on, starts life off by 10, 11, 12. It has done that all its life. It will have a different relationship to its environment and a different sense of purpose in its heart, I believe, than one that never had access to that and was always walking over concrete. Next, please. So this is kind of rethinking what the relationship between we the people and what the policymakers out there, what that relationship might be. Let's imagine we the people are doing this. We're growing our food. We're creating propaganda gardens. We're sharing the lost arts of food and cooking and whatever. And we're supporting local business. Policymakers, whoever you might be, what can you do? You don't have to do this. You might want to do something completely different. But what if you did rethink public realm and make landscapes edible? What if you did, instead of just building a hospital, actually build it with a community kitchen? So that the food that was growing around the hospital, because you've changed the estate policy of the NHS nationally, in order that we can always build hospitals and doctor's surgeries with food around them. What if you put community kitchens in them as well? So that people have the right to either bulk cook or learn new skills or just meet up uh, for a breakfast meeting, whatever it might be. And what if we, the policymakers, also thought about what we could do about supply chains? And increasingly, I know that people are thinking about that. But if we could have a, you know, a sign up to a transition so that increasingly local food was supplied from local sources, it cannot happen everywhere, but it most certainly can happen more than it does. Wouldn't it be great if we had that different relationship between citizen and state? So we were all in this for the climate and the kids' future together. Next, please. So that's why in April this year, in the House of Lords, without any money, <laughs> just because it was the obvious thing to do, we went down there and uh, Baroness Boycott, who is a crossbencher, and Baroness Young, who is a Labour peer, and others from the Tory party, although, as it happened, we couldn't get them to, to speak at the event, were all together saying, what a good idea to give our citizens the right to grow on public realm. What that's about, basically, is we're just starting with public realm. We're starting with the public spaces that are paid for by our taxation, where we could grow more food locally, and we are not asking for an ownership of that land. Because far too often, that is just the straw that breaks the camel's back of community groups that have never done this type of thing before. But if we gave people a right to grow on the public realm, if we established it in law nationally or in policy locally, what we do is change the dynamic of the conversation between the person in that community and the person in the local authority or in the government or in the health authority or wherever it might be. What we've created, the barristers who did it for free, because as I said, this isn't predicated on needing to have a load of money to do it. You just have to have the will to get up in the morning and, as I say, crack on. We've created a piece of legislation that is the Community Right to Grow Bill. It is ready to go into any levelling up legislation. It is ready to go into any rights legislation. Who knows what's happening at a national level, quite frankly, at the moment, but it is there. And increasingly, we are getting real interest from MPs and from peers on what is a very simple first step in building a more sustainable future. And one that is very relevant at the moment when hunger is so much on our minds. We've got a, um, an MP who is uh, presenting a 10 minute rule bill um, in October, November. We're not sure what the date is yet. Again, to raise the profile of this very simple, straightforward measure that could make all the difference in how we give confidence to our communities that they are part of the solution to living within environmental limits, that help people see that they themselves, through experience on the ground, can build those healthier, greener futures. And 
and and basically it's 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 something that wouldn't cost anything and it's particularly important if we can get local government to back what we're actually asking for because ultimately this is about saying at a very local level you've got green infrastructure could you do some mapping on that can we help you do that in order that you can see that land that you've got within your jurisdiction and allow people to then have a conversation with you about what they want to do with it with respect to food or with respect to biodiversity both those things are in the bill we're also pulling together a motion for local government and for metro and city regions combined authorities to help them should they want to do that be pioneers in the right to grow test with us how to make this right we're not saying we've got everything absolutely right but if we can work with the visionary local authorities that are out there or the brave housing associations who need to do things differently in order to engage all their tenants in healthier futures. If we start to do that, we start to create that proof of concept again. And we do not have to wait for a government to decide it's gonna do it. We can start doing it because time is trickling through our fingers and we need to crack on with this now. So ultimately, where we're about is saying, we the people have demonstrated we're ready to do stuff. Are the framework makers prepared to change what they're actually doing and help us through policy shifts or legislative shifts to, to make it easier for everybody to grow food in their own locality and share it and learn new skills and then go home to their own patches and maybe grow for themselves. Next, please. And ultimately, this entire big, slightly bonkers ask, which is so of its time and it's getting so much traction behind it, both in this country and elsewhere, is all predicated on that very simple statement. You need to believe the power of small actions because it's self-evident that when you start on that road, you start to find those people who want to walk it with you. And through a collaboration of like-minded people, you can actually change the future of your communities. Thank you. Uh, Pam, you've been incredible. What an incredible <laughs> person you are, and we're really grateful for that presentation. It's a it's an initiative founded by remarkable people, and it's achieved some remarkable things. Um, we've we've got a number of questions, but before that, I want to give a, a shameless plug to a, a local project which is not too dissimilar. It's called the Papillon Project, and they're encouraging schools to do the same to to basically use spare land um, and turn them into allotments and get the schools to be involved and they're facilitating that you can come along and or our audience can come along uh, in Fakenham on Saturday and learn more about that project which is happening in Norfolk. Um, a, a question uh, which has come in which is um, if one of our local communities has a spare patch of land and wants to see it used for community food growing or similar what's the first step that they should take? Okay well of course the answer to that would be when we get this legislation or this policy shift, you would just then have a meeting with your local authority people and say, right, I've got a right there. Let's have a cracker. We're going to do this between us. What will we do? What will you do? You know, would you still do the insurance? We'll do the digging and the sweat. It would start that dialogue. Without that, um, I have never had any problem whatsoever in using my own resources to grow food and to share. You only ever get legged up when you're asking folks for money, <laughs> right? And then you start to come up against the buffers. So my advice would always be start small. Start with something that you can transform fairly quickly. Make it beautiful as well as functional. Put some fantastic designs around it, you know, paint your raised bed, wonderful colours, whatever you're going to do. But make it small so that you can task and finish. Don't start something that you're going to wish you never, ever, you know, began. And once you've done that, people trust you and people start to understand. And you have learned the tricks of the trade on the way. Like you've worked out how you're going to water this thing in a drought. You know, you've worked out who's going to maintain it. You've worked out what you watch and the like. So I would start small. I would always celebrate it at harvest. I would always have a tent there cooking the food and giving it for free to people as they go along. There's very few people going to stop people showing joy and kindness to their communities 
on land that wasn't properly used previously. So just do it, but start small. Sound advice, thank you. Uh, Kate, have you got another question? I have, I've got a question from John who runs a local scout group and they've got a couple of raised beds in their scout patch and they'd like to an idea of what, what's the best thing for them to start with growing. Should they grow a little bit of everything or just concentrate on one or two? Two things. Okay. Um, so uh it depends where it is. Okay. So and and there's lots of answers to that. What I would say is if they are growing for food for sharing, that's one thing. If they're growing for their community themselves, them and their parents to use, that's another. I would say um uh, grow a few things that are going to take off well, and then think about shifting them as you move through the seasons. If you use too many diverse seeds at the beginning, it'll get terribly confusing. So you start off with simple things. Always start off with herbs. It's just dead easy. They grow fast and they look after themselves. And you might around the edges, and I don't know how large these raised beds are, definitely put some soft fruit in there because it looks after itself, you know, and, and kids of all ages love to pick it and eat it, whether it's raspberries or blueberries or whatever else it might be. Um, I would tend to do about three or four and then shift at the beginning of the year and then say March, April, May. So that would be the outside stuff like the herbs. And then as you're coming into the season, you've brought on whatever else it might be. Don't, grow, don't stick potatoes in it or carrots. You want leafy things. They need to look great. They need to look green and they need to be easily picked. So that's what I would do. I would do soft fruit. I would do herbs. I would do salad leaves. Um, and I would maybe twice a year change them so that people start to connect with that seasonality and biodiversity. So we've had um, Jenny Pedley from Edible East who were inspired by uh, the incredible Edible. Um, uh, they're also with us on Saturday. So um, Brilliant. at, at Fakenham. So, uh, if anybody's willing to come along and find out more about community growing, um, they they will be there to help. Um, we've got a question uh, from Vivian. She's asked you to to restate what the legislation was that's in progress, um, and what do you think the chances are, if anybody can predict anything at the moment, um, <laughs> the chances of that uh, being enacted? Yeah, I would be very happy to send the brief through to anybody. Um, the legislative brief. It's very boring, um, but it does the trick. Um, so um, if anybody wants that, if they get in contact with you, I'll just forward it on to them. Um, I, I, I could send it to you. Um, um, I could send you the stuff about the, the, the local motion as well. Um, so, uh, so, so what's the chance of us getting through? Do you know, I didn't crack up. I didn't start this because I wasn't optimistic. I honestly think that within the next three years, we'll have done it. I honestly think, why do I think? I think there's a lot of public realm that can't be maintained anymore. I think there's huge issues around food so sovereignty, food security and hunger. I think there's huge issues about mental health and well-being. And all this can be resolved by a sensible conversation at a local level between an anchor and its citizens. That's all this is about. And if there's a bit of a fly in the ointment because the local authority or whatever couldn't uh, find the resources to do the mapping, then we would work collectively at a national level to get that done because we can't afford to say no. You know, th this has got to work. So increasingly, the light is on in people's eyes. It's a really simple step forward. It's not gonna cost a load of money. People are ready for it. So three years, max. <laughs> <laughs> and then people will have the right and they won't have to ask. Yeah. Well, and honestly, Robert, the thing is, I honestly want to talk to local authorities who are prepared to, you know, test this out, sit down, work out how we do it and, 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 and learn from that. Um, and I know I've got one or two lined up that I'm having conversations with, but I think the more that we do that, the more we give confidence to people at a national level that this is a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got some of our local members dialed in and um, we, we'll certainly follow that conversation up. Me being on the policy maker side of things, so I'm, I'm sure there's an appetite for that. It would be lovely. It would be lovely. Um, I think sort of relating to that, I've got a question from Clive. He's asking if it is easier to sort of 
I think he means work with a formal organisation rather than form one, or if it's easier to go on your own. And Nina was asking, which is sort of related, about advice about keeping these things going, because sometimes one or two enthusiastic individuals start something off, and then if they drop out, how do yeah. you keep the momentum going? Yeah. yeah. Well, ultimately, I suppose the very end point of that would be things start and they stop. It's okay because they start and stop somewhere else. And, they're, you know, fires come all over the place. Um, in Tomlinden, which was fortunate to be the first one, all these years later, there's still um, a group of 50, of which at any time you'll get 12 out looking after the beds. Um, there are some keys to doing it. Um, if, if you have formed a group, so, no, let me, let me answer your question properly. It doesn't matter if there's two of you, do it. Do it in very public places. It doesn't matter. Tell the story, get on social media, get your tent, share the food, because you will not be two for very long. There are people all over the place that want to start to do this. But don't overstretch yourself. It's a bit like that question about, you know, how did we got some land here? Over? Don't overstretch yourself. Do it, in, do it in places where you've worked out People are going to see it. They're going to want a conversation about it. And it's going to start, it's going to attract interest. Work out how you're going to water it. So, you know, uh, that's always the big problem. So in the, in the early days before we uh, started to, some places have uh, shops that say, I'll always look at it. It's on the high street. I'll water it in front of me. But we had water books that the um, water company gave us and we collected rainwater and that was a lot easier. So you've got to work out. You wouldn't put it in somewhere that's going to be so difficult to get to to water. It, so it doesn't matter how many of you. It does matter that you do a number of manageable sites in order that you can um, make sure that they don't go under. It helps if you've got them on a walking route because you can then create a nice little map and say this is, a, this is an edible walking route along the canal, along the high street or wherever it might be. And just keep going. And if ultimately you have to change into something else or join another organisation, then that's absolutely fine because the impact you will have had on the mental well-being of a whole group of people and on the possibilities that come to other people about where they can start it. Could I do that in the school? Could I do that in the health centre? Could I do that in the church? They will have, the fires will have gone out. So it's you know, two people, so it doesn't really matter. Just start when it's manageable and don't give yourself impossible scenarios because there's no water anywhere near where you were actually doing it. Just keep telling the stories. More and more people want to do that. And, and if you want to do it through social farms, that's absolutely fine. The only difference between Incredible Edible and social farms is that on the whole, social farms do the growing and the learning. We're saying, make jobs out of it. We're saying there has to be a local economy as well, because then you start to create sustainable futures. So we're kind of a social farms with a bit extra. And you mentioned watering and um, obviously this summer, I guess, has been very challenging for anybody growing anything um, and particularly here in the east. But um, water butts have become a bit of a problem. Water butts and Legionella concerns. So the question that's come in is um, I don't want to suggest that health and safety isn't important, but how do you overcome those who like to say no? <laughs> Just crack on. Just keep going. Uh, <laughs> I thought that would uh, be the answer. I mean, honest to God, we've never killed anybody. I mean, and has anybody any idea of the rubbish that's sprayed on half the stuff that they buy from the supermarket? You know, do they have that conversation at the till? No, of course they don't have that conversation at the till. So it's a good question, and I am not being cavalier about it. And of course, the whole point of this is to create living soils that aren't full of pesticides and heaven knows what, which the stuff that you're having in the supermarket may well be full of. The whole point about this is that you can follow the provenance of it. And you would only put a water butt where you know it wasn't going to be polluted, you know, and you would make sure that it was covered. Or would, I mean, you just work that out because, again, this is a movement for people to work out things for yourself as opposed to I've got the solution to everything, which I haven't. So what I would say is remind people of the stuff that is actually on the food that they are eating. Remind people that they probably need to wash things properly if they're going to pick them from the local garden. Don't plant things in the middle of a motorway. That's not a great idea. But there's lots of places that aren't in the middle of the motorway where you can grow stuff that's not right next to the main road. So again, it's about thinking that through. Um, and 
and in particular thinking through how you can mulch some basic things about keeping this, the, the moisture in the soil, how you can plant things that don't need a right lot of feeding, herbs, soft fruits, things like that. Because again, what we're not doing is feeding the population. What we are doing is changing the mindset. So it's just about being a little bit savvy whilst being totally respectful of, of, of the health and environment concerns. But basically, they're pretty low down the pecking order. <laughs> Wonderful. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for your presentation, for your inspiration. Um, I just uh, remind everybody that we have recorded this session. We'll be sharing it um, online and we'll encourage everybody to, to share it more because that's how community initiatives um, begin to spread. So thank you. A big, big virtual round of applause from everybody thank here. So um, thanks to Kate and for Nige for keeping the, the steady platform going. And um, we look forward to meeting you perhaps in person one day soon.